For today's program, we're delighted to welcome uh, our in-person and online audience, um, which have signed up from various parts in the United States and, and Europe. Um, I, of course, would like to thank Greenberg Traurig, um, a President Circle member of EACC Florida, for hosting this EACC Florida pr program. And there's an extraordinary support team who are actually making this first hybrid program possible. I would also like to thank EACC Florida corporate member, Plaskin, uh, USA, who are sponsoring the networking reception later today. And now without further delay, I'd like to introduce our moderator. Um, Alan Sutton is a longtime lawyer here at Greenberg Traurig. He's principal shareholder and the senior chair of the firm's global intellectual property and technology practice. But that's not what we're talking about today. And, but mostly, most importantly for us today, Alan will be, uh, the he's the president of the ACC Florida and he will be the moderator for the day. So Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christina. And welcome everybody, both in person and online to what I think is gonna be a very interesting discussion with uh, a very experienced uh, uh, panel. So um, some of you may know that now it's been just about two months since the US administration unveiled the National Blueprint for Transportation Declaration, which is a um, landmark interagency strategy for uh, strategies and actions to remove uh, all emissions from transportation sector by 2050. Um, it, this is a, um, a multimodal approach to the issue to increase convenience, improve efficiency, uh, and transition from where we are today to cleaner transportation options. Uh, building and relying on historic investments and fundings from the Infrastructure Reduction Act, the blueprint that was announced a couple of months ago is an ambitious but achievable, uh, we think, um, program to uh, reduce emissions for various, uh, to various points throughout 2030, 2040, and 2050. Uh, and of course, the, um, it's an enabler of the strategy, the, uh, in, the uh, Reduction Act uh, is perceived around the world as a crucial, crucial step in deglobalization efforts. At the same time, the European Union aims to be climate neutral by 2050. Uh, an economy with net zero greenhouse gas emissions and the objective in the heart of the European Green Deal. And under the Green Deal, the European Union is also committed to reduce the transport uh, industry's carbon emissions by 90% by 2050. So today's program is particularly timely, timely particularly uh, in light of last Friday's uh, joint US and EU uh, announcement that Christina referenced in her uh, introduction here. Um, so uh, let me take a moment and uh, introduce uh, to you this terrific panel we have that will sort of explain in practice uh, what all of this means and discuss some of the opportunities and challenges afforded by these developments from both the US and the EU perspectives, uh, as well as the local spec, uh, uh, perspectives and from the business side. You've all received copies of the bios of our panelists, so I will only very briefly introduce them for the benefit of our online audience. Um, Sam Skinner, who is a, a, a longtime lawyer here at uh, Greenberg Traurig, uh, but importantly for these purposes, a former United States Secretary of Transportation, uh, and before that, uh, White House Chief of Staff for George H.W. Bush, uh, had uh, planned to be here with us in person today, but he was uh, called away to a meeting at the White House, which actually is taking place uh, as we speak right now. So um, Sam, very uh, generously recorded a video um, uh, to address you by video while he's attending this meeting, and we will uh, turn to that very shortly. Um, Gazim Okakoglu, I get it close this time. I've done Gazim a while, but I get it. It's hard for me to say every time. Um, his first uh, counselor on mobility and transport in the EU delegation in Washington, D.C. Gazim was in Miami last year on official business, and we're delighted that you're back. Uh, this year with us and appreciate your being here today. Um, if anyone, Gazim has his finger on the pulse of uh, the discussions taking place between the US and EU on these uh, important issues that we're going to discuss here today. Um, uh, with us also uh, next to Gazim is um, Emmanuel Debat, 
who is the National Sales Development Manager for Quascon here in Miami. He'll be speaking together with David Canarbalon, uh, Vice President of Supply Chain Management at Quascon, who's joining us remotely from Lyon, France today. Hello. Um, uh, and uh, at the uh, far end of the table is uh, Dr. Galen Troyer, who leads the climate and tech innovation for Miami-Dade County. We look forward to hearing what he has to say about some of the local initiatives um, in terms of sustainability and transportation, uh, some of which have been making uh, headlines. So let's get the discussion started by hearing from uh, Sam Skinner. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry I can't be with you today. Uh, I really wanted to be, but uh, I've decided that if I can't be with you, I ought to share a few of my thoughts. I'm going to be in Washington tomorrow and have a meeting at the very same time it's your meeting. I want to say that this session you're having this afternoon is timely. And it's a timely session because a lot is happening in the space that's so very important to us. Decarbonization in transportation is in fact happening. It's no longer thinking about it. People are taking action. And obviously, as indicated by this group that we're working with today, it is a world effort. The United States can lead in this effort, both from the political and government sector, but the rest of the countries are going to have to play their role, and I'm sure they will, and they are already. Uh, the first step that I think we can celebrate is the new national blueprint for transportation decarbonization, an example of leadership. I think that report is very well done. It's 88 pages long, so it's not a bad read, and I encourage all of you to read it. As you'll see when you go through the report, it's a multi-agency effort. It's committed by the Biden administration to have agencies work with each other on this very real issue. And it's an indication that uh, it's very important to the administration as it is to our nation. I wanna point out though, it's a strategy. It's not an execution plan. The action will, will occur many years, for many years over many countries with the private sector and individual action. Uh, this plan and the implementation of this plan and decarbonization throughout the world is going to require the cooperation and leadership of government and the private sector working together. I might add, it's got to be bipartisan in nature. And uh, uh, as a result of that, uh, it, was, it, it requires cooperation between nations, cooperation between manufacturers, cooperation between public interest groups. And that is happening. The forum today, you'll learn more about what's going on in the world and that's going on in the United States, but also what's going on in places that we really, really aren't that familiar with all over the world. They're already taking steps for decarbonization. It will be an opportunity for you to learn. And more importantly, I think it'll be an opportunity for you to decide what role you want to play and what leadership you want to be part of and how you can make a difference in this very important issue. This is a marathon, not a sprint. There are no quick fixes. The good news, as I've indicated earlier, it's already happened. Leaders in government and the private sector are already stepping up all over the world. We can see it from the automobile manufacturers, the manufacturers of heavy equipment, the governments uh, that are taking leadership roles. They're prioritizing it just as this administration is. And I think that's very good. We should caution you though, this is not gonna be an easy effort. This is a long-term program. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And they're gonna be making mistakes and will be making mistakes. But I'm comfortable with the dialogue like we're having today. We will learn from these mistakes and we'll have a better plan and a better execution and better results. I'm confident, and I wasn't that confident a few years ago, that all of us are committed to this effort for decarbonization. But that's the really good news here. We're really, walking the talk. And I think that's that's essential uh, to make success and essential that we work with each other, learn from each other, and participate. But this is really a, a joyous moment for our nation. It allows us to make a difference. It allows us to take action that will make a difference not only for us, but for generations to come. And I'm glad to be part of it, and I'm glad you're part of it, and I hope you have a great day. And uh, thank you very much for understanding that I can't be with you, but hopefully this will be a few things to think about as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. The um, 
so Sam has sort of given us a very brief sort of setup from a US point of view, but Gazim, there's probably nobody closer to this issue than, than you in the, uh, the EU delegation. So maybe you could add to what Sam said and sort of set the table from us, uh, uh, you know, particularly from an EU and transatlantic perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Miami and a pleasure to be back here at uh, Green Vectoric. And um, so just to, to, to reflect as well on a few things that Sam mentioned to us. Uh, first of all, you know, we are absolutely delighted to see that the US also has its blueprint for decarbonization, this overall strategy. And uh, as a matter of fact, you mentioned that the, in Europe, we had the sustainable and, and smart mobility strategy adopted actually two years ago. Uh, with a number of plans, but actually the good news is that we have the common objectives, which is to almost totally decarbonize, de decarbonize sorry, uh, transportation by 2050. And uh, interestingly also, uh, we may have a number of uh, different tools or instruments uh, that we are using, but also we have a lot of common tools, and I will say a few words about, about those. But first of all, what is important to know is that in Europe, uh, you know, the, the Green Deal that you mentioned, uh, we have set that in, in law. So we have collectively, the member states of Europe, have agreed to, uh, reduce, uh, to, to reduce the greenhouse gas emission by 55% by 2030, to start with, and to make it totally uh, uh, by zero by 2050. It's law, so it means that member states will be uh, uh, accountable for, for making sure that this is happening. But at the same time, it's a drive politically, and it's a signal politically that it is what collectively, not only the, uh, the leaders of the member states, but also the population wants to go. So it's, it's a really clear political mandate that we had three years ago to go in that direction. What has happened since then? Um, and, and clearly what some mentioned, the complexity of the things on the one hand, uh, but also the fact that things are happening. In Europe, what we have done on this basis and as part of our strategy is to work in three areas. One area is that each mode of transport, and I will say a few words about that later on, has different level of a carbon footprint, if you want, and emissions. So, but each mode of transport needs to contribute, whether they emit a lot. We know that the road sector is the most emitting sector, and uh, actually it's very visible here in the US with all those measures for EVs and uh, lots of investments in uh, battery factories, lots of investment also on EV charging, but also we need to focus on maritime transport and aviation because those are two uh, modes of transport which are harder to decarbonize for that matter and which are also global and where this global approach is even more warranted. So first of all, focus on decarbonizing each mode of transport. Secondly, we also have to reflect in a multimodal approach. So basically we need to put in place uh, a system where we would encourage the use of the most or the least emitting a mode of transport when possible and create the situations where the choice is there either for the people, I mean, for passenger transport or for the shippers when they need to, uh, to carry their goods uh, across uh, different areas. Third element, is where do we bring the right incentive as policymakers, as regulators to make this happen? And clearly when we talk about incentives, you have what some people call very often the, the carrots. And in that sense, in the US, the Inflation Reduction Act is seen principally, uh, essentially as carrot with tax credits, with a, a lot of funds provided. We use the word, the word the subsidies is used, we don't like this, but it's really an incentive. And sometimes we see what we call more negative incentives or, um, or considered as a, as a stick is regulation, i.e. we put a framework, we put target, sometimes binding targets. And uh, you will see that very often put in place by, by Europe because we've been working uh, like this in the past and we've seen also the benefits when you talk about the, the so-called carbon market, so the emission trading schemes, we've seen by putting this into place and making it mandatory for industry, there is a reaction by industry which takes measures to reduce their carbon footprint. 
and at the same time by putting certain mandates uh, in in helping actually, and we, we think it creates a framework, a regulatory framework, but at the same time industrial framework for the different actors to know that, well, we have this target, we better get started working and put our money uh, uh, into that because at the end of the day, it will be a mandate. So incentives, when I talk about incentive, this is also an area. So we work in all those spaces and obviously, and I will just finish by, by indicating what we do. When you look at road transport, uh, the most, I would say, emblematic measures that we've taken at the European level, and in the last days, there's a bit of confusion also, is what has been done also in California, which is to say by 2035, we'll not allow the putting into service or the, the sale of vehicles which are not zero emission. Some people say it's basically pressing, pushing for uh, electrical vehicles only. It's not only that, but of course, with uh, today's available technology, this is what it hints to. So that's one thing. When you look at the uh, heavy duty vehicles, uh, so the, the, the trucks, et cetera, for the transport of goods, nowadays, when you look at the road emission sectors, at least in Europe, the transport of goods is responsible for about 25% of those road emissions. So that's why no later than a couple of weeks ago, the commission put, uh, proposed actually a new regulation to also incentivize and at least push uh, the, uh, the heavy duty sectors to reduce the emission of uh, trucks, heavy duty vehicles by 90% by 2040. And at the same time, make it mandatory that all buses in cities uh, by 2030 are zero emission. So those are other signals. And of course, now we, we enter into the European uh, uh, regulatory making with discussions between the European Parliament and the Council, so our member states, so it's a process. But just to say that for the road, uh, the, the main area is to press for uh, legislation. And next to that, there will also be incentive because we also have a number of fund funding which we made available uh, to help the electrification, to help the charging infrastructure, which is needed. In other areas, aviation or maritime, there the idea is also to put in place a framework which require that we reduce the carbon footprint, uh, both in aviation and in uh, maritime. For aviation, it is really pushing for the use of so-called sustainable aviation fuel which is the main alternatives to reduce the carbon footprint of uh, the kerosene, so the jet fuel, basically. So push for that. And there we put targets uh, between now and 2050, incre increasing targets of the uptake of those fuels uh, by the, uh, in the airports. Likewise, in the maritime sectors, we are imposing a reduction of the greenhouse gas um, uh, intensity of the fuels used by maritime sector uh, between 2% in 2025, all the way to 75%. And again, one of the good news, and we see already that uh, certainly both in aviation and maritime, the industry, there is a buy-in, they want to do that. One of the challenges is on the supply side. So you need a number of instruments to help the producers produce those, uh, those uh, biofuels or sustainable fuels or uh, synthetic fuel for that matter, which are even less carbon incentives. So just to say that we have now a wealth of different measures pressing ahead. And uh, as, I, as I said in my early, uh, in, the, in, the, in the first few elements, and as uh, Sam said as well, things are happening. Uh, we are working uh, together also with the US Certainly at the global, global level in terms of aviation and, uh, and maritime sectors, we work in the context of the International Civil Aviation Authority uh, organization uh, with the US to press the industry and the states to, uh, to adhere to this uh, uh, zero carbon by 2050. Likewise, in the maritime sector, a lot of those standards are put in place in the International Maritime Organization 
and we uh, we aim actually this year because there will be the, the assembly uh, later in the autumn of the International Maritime, Maritime Organization in London. We aim this year to press together with the US and all the a number of actors, number of countries <coughs> who are willing to help us into uh, uh, zero emission or at least uh, uh, carbon neutral uh, maritime sector by 2050. Just to say that a lot of challenges, uh, a lot of goodwill, a lot of collaboration, and uh, be happy to dive into some specifics. After well, that. I have a, a particular question on, on the challenges as it relates to doing this in the international sector in maritime and aviation. So clearly, if you look at the joint statement uh, between the, the US and the EU, uh, you know, there's a lot of close collaboration working together. You, uh, as I was reciting the, the standards, they're very similar. So everybody's headed to the same goal. Is that true? I haven't heard as much discussion about what's going on in other parts of the world. Is there a similar focus on this issue in other regions of the world? And, and in terms of uh, support, in terms of well, in terms of, of support, participation in the international discussions. Uh, as I said, the uniformity of the goals between the EU and the, the U.S. seems to, you know every. Every region is going to have their own individual issues, mm. but at least the overall goals seem to be quite aligned between the European Absolutely. No, I mean, I will say quickly, in the aviation sector, there was the uh, ICAO assembly uh, at the end of, uh, of last year. And there, the major outcome is that despite the fact that you had a number of uh, countries which were, I would put it mildly diplomatically, less ambitious than the US and the EU and, uh, and uh, some of our, I would say, uh, uh, aligned countries, I'm talking about Australia, UK, uh, Singapore and Japan and others to press for this uh, objective to have so-called long-term aspirational goal of uh, uh, carbon-free uh, aviation by 2050, despite some countries, and here I will mention it, it was uh, China, Russia, <laughs> and, and some uh, of the usual suspects not really jumping on the bandwagon to, to that. Despite that, we managed to have a majority to vote for this uh, long-term uh, aspiration goal. And this was on aviation side. So this is also a testimony that it is possible that globally, it's not only EU and the US, but we have really uh, a willingness to, to, uh, to work on that. In the maritime sector, uh, actually some years ago, maritime sectors was ahead of aviation in the sense that there was already an objective to reduce by 50% the, uh, the greenhouse gas emission of maritime by 2050. But now, I, I don't know if it's because of aviation now has taken this step of going zero, but certainly for a long time, there was pressure also on the maritime sector to be even more ambitious. And I have to say that industry, when I say industry, ocean carriers, but also industry making uh, uh, ships and, uh, uh, and, and coming up with new fuels as somehow explain, show that it is possible. It is possible to be more uh, ambitious. And this is what we are aiming for. But in the maritime sector, uh, it's, <clears throat> I would say, probably even more challenging because there, uh, when you look at the uh, overall footprint of the flag state um, uh, over the world, that's where discussion might be a bit more challenging, but with the usual suspect, we need to, to get, uh, you know, uh, or to try to, to have a, uh, either to have all of those uh, uh, countries on board or make sure that they don't block uh, the, the common view or the, the vote that will happen at the end of the day. But of course, uh, the good news, I would say, and, uh, you know, working into this, this, uh, this field and when you have the different COP, generally speaking, not only on transport there, uh, showing that there is will, uh, there will be means also provided by the more wealthy countries to support the ones which uh, have more uh, challenges there. Uh, it helps us going forward, but we need to, to maintain the, you know, the, the, the ambition and maintain also the work to work together in that space. Well, Commander uh, Al, the um, Gazim sort of, set the table for us from a governmental uh, point of view. Maybe you'd like to, could you, if you could pass that to me? Maybe you and David like to sort of give us a point of view from the business side of uh, being a logistics um, company of some of these issues. Thank you, yes. The idea is to 
go to concrete and see nowadays what does it mean and what can we do today in order to uh, start decarbonizing now and keep decarbonizing as the new technology is coming on. David, you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, I'm ready. Floor is yours. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Uh, and um, I have uh, only six slides, so that's very easy. And then uh, we made it, uh, we prepared with Emmanuel so that they are very concrete as business cases. Uh, you can go to next one. Uh, first one is to uh, picture uh, when you transport goods from China to Florida, uh, what is the amount of uh, carbon footprint of the transportation here to compare an apple with an apple, 20 tons of cargo, that's a heavy container, but it happens, uh, transported by sea all water to uh, the region of Miami uh, creates an amount of just over three tons of carbon. And if you do the same by air freight, either in one shipment or in multiple shipments, uh, the amount of carbon is almost multiplied by 90, reaching an amount of 263 uh, tons of uh, carbon. So, Having said that, we have two challenges here. The first challenge is very obvious, is how to reduce air freight. And uh, uh, taking this into consideration, we uh, browse all the options that were available to serve the business and to continue serve the, uh, the business for our clients. And you can go to the next slide. Going from China, uh, to destination Florida. We see that we have, uh, in terms of proportion, 1999% 90, uh, of the problem that is on the main leg, that is to say the air freight, the trucking uh, before the shipment and the trucking after the shipment, uh, are very uh, limited in terms of impact. So let's focus on the main leg. And here are the options. This is all the options that uh, have been studied uh, with one of our real clients in the uh, area. Uh, we have an option to go by air to Chicago and then continue by uh, road. And we have an option to go all water from Shanghai to Miami by sea freight. And in the middle, we have the land bridge options to go by uh, water Trans-Pacific to uh, Los Angeles area, Long Beach Seaport, and to continue the delivery by rail or by road to cross the country from west to east. And if you see the decarbonization uh, that is at stake and also the transit time, and you can move one click to, to see what has been the, the choice taken by the client. Uh, we have made some trade-offs. This is an arbitration. You cannot win on everything. And decarbonization of here for the sea road via Los Angeles is up to minus 84%, which is a lot, and not damaging uh, in such a proportion that it will uh, uh, kill the business, the transit time. The transit time is less than two times from uh, door to door compared to the all water uh, solution that will be uh, so much slow in terms of order to delivery so that the business will not be the same at all. So in terms of quick win, we have here one applicable solution that uh, gives a large impact in terms of carbon footprint from the air freight uh, from uh, Shanghai area to Miami area. So it's very interesting. Thank you, David, because it's exactly what Gzim said, multimodal solution. And here is a true example in Miami by your customer, European-based, 
So looking to uh, improve his CO2 emission and the politics and the economics are working and joining together. Thank you. So then we have another challenge. The second challenge is how to decarbonize uh, the, the flows of the clients that are not having any air freight because of the goods, uh, the, the goods value, because the nature of the, the goods itself, when the, the weight is very high or whatever. So these uh, clients are having only C freight, but we can focus as well on C freight. So let's see the proportion as well. Uh, this is uh, one of the clients that has some destination warehouse in the middle of Florida. And we see that the proportion are not at all the same. Only 70% uh, of the carbon is emitted on the main transport leg. And we have 30% of which 25% uh, percent of the carbon that are emitted in Florida. So maybe much more easy to manage because they are on hand. We have the solution over there. We can act directly on the, the solution. We have maybe uh, it, because of the, the, the knowledge of the, the, um, the subcontractors, uh, more solutions to decarbonize. And if you can go to the next slide, we have over there the map as well to uh, the available alternatives and available alternatives may change the origin seaport from Sheku uh, to Yantian, all of, uh, all of them in the south of China, using different routes to reach all of the seaports that are available. The nominal solution uh, used by the, cli the client is Charleston because of the number of services, because of the, the reliability of the, the port performance and so and so. But we uh, put the light on all the solutions that are available, considering the transit time, considering the congestion, considering the transshipment, uh, and also the decarbonization. And our client, if you can push one click again, our client moved to this solution, considering the, uh, the nearest support to uh, its distribution center. Uh, reducing the amount of kilometers by road freight and having an impact of minus 20% using these seaports. So we see over there that the transit time is a bit longer, uh, another three or four days, uh, which is 10%. It has an impact, but in terms of decarbonization, we have here another set of, of available solutions that we can uh, use now without any waiting time. Yeah, again, another real case. Uh, here we see that uh, often the reason not to decarbonize is lack of awareness, lack of uh, knowledge, or resistance to change. He's always been using Charleston, why, why change? And, and then when we looked at the decarbonization option, we mapped all the solution and we found a, a way to increase a little bit the transit time, but decrease by 20% the CO2 emission. As uh, we said, it's always a trade-off. We have to, to choose, but that's the way that we can all win if we make a little concession somewhere. So when this being said, we come back to uh, uh, the supply chain performance. And if we can, Move to the next slide. So the classic supply chain performance indicator are divided in two families, the client-centric performance indicators, which, which are uh, responsiveness, reliability, and flexibility, where you are uh, connected to your client, and the organization-centric performance indicator, which are located in two families, cost and cash. And if you move to the sustainable supply chain, there's another set. Uh, of indicators that are now uh, available uh, to all and uh, more and more they become uh, from let's say uh, new indicators to indicators that come in the picture and uh, more and more they are decision indicators the decision maker put this uh, planet centric performance indicators uh, in their decision uh, metrics. Thank you. Uh, 
I have a question. Uh, you, uh, Emmanuel and David, you, uh, David made the point, and, and I think you repeated it, uh, about dealing with your client, which was a European client. Do you notice in your business any difference uh, between the nationality of, of the shippers uh, and the positions they take? You don't have to call up specific nationalities. I'm just curious whether there's a difference depending on. Uh, David, how often do you work on something like that, CO2? Uh... Yeah, this kind of business, uh, I do uh, one or two per week for clients. That is to say that it is very customized uh, slides with uh, the, 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 the light on a specific trade so that our clients, they, they put this in their design, in their supply chain design, in their supply chain planification as well, and the, in the execution. Uh, but uh, if you uh, question the number of clients that are putting this uh, decarbonization in their discussion with us, that's all of them. 100% of the, our clients in Europe, or maybe especially in France, more than in, maybe in Poland, uh, but 100% of them, they put this in their discussion with us. Some of them, only an Excel survey with small question, but most of them, they, are, they have done their carbon footprint, COP123, uh, accurately for the last one or two years and they are now facing the challenges and they are asking us for solutions. And we have as well some uh, clients that are ahead and they are uh, changing, they are in a transformation plan and they are asking us to support them or even, even more, they are trying to drive innovation from us because they, uh, there is plenty of innovation that are from the organization and practices uh, and they add up in the decarbonization to um, innovation in the technology. Thank you. So one or two per week and 100% of the customer uh, here in Miami, in the US, we have the case every quarter, roughly. However, it's becoming hotter and hotter. Like in December, I got a call from IMSA, the International Motorsport Association of America, asking us to look at decarbonization of the supply chain because they see that more and more their customers are racing on hybrid cars, Ferrari, BMW, Toyota, and Porsche and Audi coming up with hybrid because they want to be green. So I, IMSA was like, okay, what do we do as two to be green? Because sooner or later, they are going to be asking, what are we going, doing to do for uh, the uh, environment? So it's getting there, it's getting there. That answer doesn't surprise me. I think uh, we do see that too. It is now gaining uh, amongst our clients here, but of course, Europe's a little bit further ahead than, uh, um, from, a, from a societal focus on this issue than we are. But we are definitely, it's definitely becoming a, a prime issue. And on that subject, um, maybe um, Galen will, will turn to you and try to bring it down from this international level and talk a little bit more about what's happening locally here in Miami and how this is playing out um, in Miami and some of the initiatives that you work on. Great, yeah, no, it's, um, this is, it's great to be on this panel with all of you and to be with you, everyone here and the folks online. And the, this is just super critical for Miami, right? We're the most financially vulnerable place to sea level rise in the world. Um, and that means that our transportation system is also vulnerable. So we, you know, we're adapting and we have plans, but we have to do our part to reduce emissions. Otherwise, it, you know, we, we can't be taken seriously, right? And so I think just to put that out there, that is critically important. And I have a mayor um, who absolutely agrees. She says the same thing, right? My, my role in the county is to work on climate with the private sector and see how we can implement um, as much of our goals as possible because we're not gonna make it with just the government doing it. Um, so this is super exciting. Uh, I think that, so our goals are to cut emissions 50% by 2040 and to get to zero by 2050. Um, and what's great about that now is that any cuts contribute to our goal, right? So we don't have to argue about like how much have we 
are we are we reaching the 20% reduction from 2008? We're just all trying to get to zero. And it's really, I think it's opening up possibilities. Um, and what, just to go take a step back, um, last week we had Aspen Ideas Climate here in Miami Beach. And there was a gentleman who's working on um, decarbonization with JP Morgan, um, he's leading their work globally. And he said, don't, just don't bet against the federal government. And I think that that's super key, right? We're investing a trillion dollars, essentially, from the, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, and then also the Inflation Reduction Act and CHIPS, but essentially a billion dollars in the energy transition over the next, and our infrastructure that will support it over the next 10 years. And he said that the private sector is going to be adding about two, um, a, yeah, a trillion dollars over 10 years, and the private sector is going to add two trillion to that. Uh, to that. And it's like, this is very real. And we want that investment in Miami. And specific things that we want to do are um, decarbonize the supply chain into our port. So we have a vision of a net zero supply chain. And that would include inland ports, where we would be able to expand and increase the speed at which we can accept cargo which is really important because we don't have a lot more space at the dock, right? But if we can go faster, we can do that. And when we do that, we want it to be entirely electric or at least carbon free, because we know from the, the federal blueprint, there are some like heavy industries that are going to be hydrogen or some other alternative fuel. Um, and then in addition, we have looked at where our emissions come from. And we're really fortunate to have one of the preeminent airports in the world here, but it does account for about 20% of our emissions community-wide, which is significant. And that is something that we don't have a, a clear lever on, right? So we have to work with our partners and we have to work with the whole network of, of folks who are flying planes and fueling planes because we actually don't want air travel to decrease at MIA, right? We've become the busiest international cargo port, airport, and that's great. It's good for our economy, and, and it's part of what lends to our strategic advantage in Miami, which is that we're a hub for Latin America and, and Europe as well, entering into the United States. And that, that cargo port makes that possible because you can rapidly you know, service your clients, um, it also brings people in. It's easy to fly to Miami and that matters. And it means that we can meet in person, we can make deals, we can have people move here. And um, I'm just looking at some folks from Drives, which is uh, an EV software company. And there are people moving here to Miami because it's a viable option now. Post pandemic, this is a very viable place to live and innovate. And um, I'm just super excited about it. So I think I will leave it at that and then we can talk, you guys can ask specific questions. What do you think companies can be doing to help Miami meet, meet its goals? In this area? Oh, they, there's a lot. You guys can state your goals and we need leadership, you know? We need leadership in this community. So if you've come to the community and you're like, hey, you know, we, we're bringing in our, our like European goals, but maybe we shouldn't step up and, and put that front and center. I, I would say, put it out, you know, tell us what you can do. Be bold about it. This is a huge, bold transition. It is the most exciting thing and the biggest investment that we're gonna make. Um, and if we get it right, it's transformational and it saves us, you know? And so I think if you're coming in from, uh, from Europe, and you have a great example of something that you've done, please share it with us. Um, I like, so we've talked a little bit about the Netherlands, and like, the Netherlands is about the same size as the US, but it has a lot more people, um, or not the US, <laughs> Miami Dade. <laughs> We're the same physical size. They have a lot more people, <laughs> but like the distance from Utrecht uh, to Amsterdam is the same as Fort Lauderdale to Miami Dade. There's like a lot of things that you can map onto it, but there, um, there are 
they have a totally different regulatory situation and in collaboration with industry. And so I've heard from multiple startups in the energy and EV space that they're getting more traction and they're able to test things out. I talked to a quantum computing company that is trying out their software and their solutions there that would work incredibly well in the US, but they haven't been forced by the regulators yet to get to that point. Um, so I, yeah, I think that that is, it's, it's fun to be here right now working on this. Is there something you would identify as your biggest challenge? From in Miami? Yeah. There are a few very specific challenges. Um, one of them is sea level rise, right? We adapting to the changes in, in sea level and also heat. So I would just say climate adaptation, that, that's very real here. And I think it's one of our advantages too, like it, climate adaptation companies have been underinvested in or those solutions are underinvested in. The returns are really good. So if we adapt our coastal buildings to sea level rise, we can get a nine to one return. And that nine to one return is just on the 10 year flood. So that's not the big hurricane floods, that's just nuisance flooding. Um, and that's like really, that's a really good return, but we don't know how to finance that yet. Um, and I think that, that that's kind of just like lost money. Uh, I know that we're talking about decarbonization of transport, but if we don't do that, <laughs> we won't solve it. Yeah. The, um, we do have a question from one of our online um, participants, which uh, I want to uh, put to the to the entire panel, whoever wants to respond to it, and which may take us in a slightly different direction. The, the question is whether or not any of you see ride sharing and last mobility playing a role in in, uh, de -cities, in cities decarbonizing, and whether autonomous vehicles will be a factor. Uh, anybody want to <laughs> point of view about that? I, I can I can certainly start on that. So. Um, Let's start by saying that uh, you know the, the promise of ride sharing as such to reduce the uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, in, in cities, uh, that promise uh, out of a number of studies that have been shown has not materialized. On the contrary, actually, because of all those you know uh, uh, running around or circling around in cities looking for for uh, for uh, for space for customers basically to hop in. Uh, we haven't seen really a reduction. It has even sometimes increased the greenhouse gas uh, emissions, the CO2 emissions in some cities. And, and the reason is, um, well, I won't say there is a reason. The reason is, what is the business model for ride sharing per se? Uh, ride sharing will fulfill its promise uh, as an alternative mode of transport, which is cleaner potentially or contributing uh, only if it becomes really um, fully autonomous on the one hand, but also if it fulfills a mission, which is to provide a mobility solution, which is not offered otherwise. Uh, so uh, if you have a situations where you have, thanks to ride sharing appearing in a market in a city, people deciding not to use their car at all and maybe to go for public transport and if needed by uh, using ride sharing, if you're the majority of people doing that, it could have a positive effect. But certainly uh, as, as, it, as it stands right now, it does not fulfill that promise. It, it fulfill a promise to give one additional options to the passengers. I use it also sometime. It's okay when I don't use, when I don't use the bus, Actually, I use the bus. I use the bus in, in Miami today, this morning, <laughs> to come from Miami Beach to here. So I'm, I try to use the alternatives when those are efficient and available at all. And ride sharing is one of those, but now it does not fulfill that. In the future, when all the ride sharing companies decide and they've pledged to do that, to go for electrical, if they give the example and they help the transition to uh, a decarbonized means of transport like EVs, uh, it becomes arguably. But at the end of the day, 
even for those companies, they will become, uh, I would say, uh, uh, they will have the right business models once they won't have any driver in it, once they will go to autonomy. And that is really the path that at least some of those were per pursuing. I mean, uh, Uber and others didn't hide the fact that their end object objectives is to have autonomous vehicles. But this leads us in another discussion uh, on the challenges of going towards autonomy. Uh, so uh, that's that's another uh, discussion of you know legal challenges uh, that that we have there. Having said that, just to to complete maybe the the my, my views on on the role of ride sharing. Ride sharing again have a role when they provide an additional options to people, but this works only when you have enough uh, low emission options. Public transportation is clean. Public transportation. I was giving the example of, of, uh, of uh, you know, EV buses or, or even Metro, as long, when you talk about electrification, as long as the electricity that you use is also clean, by the way. Otherwise, uh, it's not really that helpful uh, as well. So yeah. that's in short. So the way, oh, the way that we, um, I think the thing that, another way to put it is if ride sharing can drive, can lead to a mode shift in, in what, how people get around in mode shifts. It's like in our climate strategy, we are trying for a 10% mode shift away from single occupancy vehicles. So if ride sharing can actually drive that, then it's successful. <laughs> um, but if it can't, it doesn't, it doesn't help us that much. Though I have heard that from Uber that 10% of their rides in Miami are, no, 10% of the rides to the port, which are mostly cruise passengers, are now EVs. And it was 0.2% a year ago. So not that that's a panacea either. <laughs> Just like a stat to share. On the cargo side? Oh, oh, yeah. On the cargo side, so uh, last week, Uber announced the spin-off of uh, Uber Freight. So it's it's right topic, right? Um, it's like uh, Uberization, it's like consolidation. It's what we've done all the time in freight. So there is a big future for Uber Freight in the cargo area. Right now, uh, when you see a truck on the highway, there is 30% chance that it's empty. So, so I think it can be the ride sharing slash consolidation, <clears throat> Uberization can bring a lot of positive stuff for the cargo. And I don't think it's new, it's just a making it easier with technology. And I would think, uh, not as, not being somebody who regularly works in this area, but it makes sense to me that if autonomous ride sharing took hold over time and people purchased less cars, that would contribute to it. Particularly since, uh, as I understand it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but EVs, when they're produced, have a much higher carbon footprint than combustion engines. So they start life actually in, with an increased carbon footprint. Now, over time, the emissions they say that that wears off. But if a modal shift, as you're describing it, causes people to buy fewer cars, that also contributes, which which suggests to me that the real solution in all these areas, but I think that's a, an example of it, is it's a much more complex subject where you have to take into account things some people don't think about. I, I think colloquially, for people who don't work in the area, they, they treat decarbonization and emissions-free is the same thing, but they really aren't. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, th I think you have a point that when you look at one specific element, I mean, electrification as a main vector to decarbonize road transport, uh, it's hot, you enter uh, quite, uh, quite quickly into a debate. Uh, what about, as you were saying, the, uh, the, the greenhouse gas emission for the production of the car, which indeed for electric car because of the batteries as well is higher. So in the start of the lifetime of your vehicles, in a given point there, yes, you have already emitted more emission than if you had another type of vehicles. And it's really after uh, the usage uh, uh, of the car after, and then you can debate uh, how fast you get there that you, uh, you become uh, carbon, I would say neutral. Uh, but that, this discussion is also, you also need to consider basically the, the life cycle emission, take into account not only the production, 
uh, but also the, uh, in the case of electricity, is the electricity clean or not? Because this makes a huge difference. And, uh, and so uh, that, that is why, you know, uh, it's really difficult to only look at one specific example and have uh, a discussion with, uh, with people, especially with, with cars and EVs, because this can get also emotional because my car is my liberty, my freedom. So uh, I still want to have a, a car and I'm happy if it's electrical or not. Uh, but, but still, you need to work on all those areas. You need to make sure that the electricity that you produce is from renewable or it's clean. I would say when I say renewable, it's pure renewable. So uh, solar, wind, et cetera. And uh, clean could be also produced by uh, nuclear. But then you will have the, the nuclear people or anti-nuclear people will, will be against me saying that they're also negative effect of nuclear uh, because of the waste. Yes, but certainly it's, it's not emitting, emitting any greenhouse gas emission. And we are also going into that eh, because uh, carb, uh, decarbonization of transport will be successful is if at the same time we decarbonize also the, uh, the production of the energy that you need. That is why when you talk about those, certainly the difficult to, uh, to decarbonize areas, which are uh, maritime and aviation, which today are only fossil fuels or mainly fossil fuel, you need to look at this in a life cycle. So the whole life cycle of the production uh, of the vessels, uh, of the fuel itself. And as was also shown in one of the example, you still see that um, in, all, in all this life cycle, it is actually the, the fuel usage, which is the largest share of greenhouse gas emission huh? in, in all this. So the production is, is not uh, it's far from zero. It can be uh, a strong in the, in the case of EVs, as you mentioned, but certainly it's the usage itself that we need to work. And that is why we have all those, this work going into finding the alternative fuels uh, which uh, have uh, less, uh, less uh, emission. At this, and at the same time, working on alternatives, this multimodal concept and modal shift uh, and all those elements. It's complex. The, the bottom line, uh, as you were saying, uh, uh, Alan, and I think also Sam said, it's complex and it requires works in all those areas. Um, where I find really encouragement is to see not only companies like Clasquin and others looking at the quick wins today, quick wins based on the use of, in more intensive use of digitalization to get the right data information and awareness and understanding of what are the different options, because there are different options. You need to understand that and to convince the people that uh, it meets one of their objectives, be it time, money, or uh, you know, easiness of uh, taking your, your ship. Uh, uh, but, but also to, uh, to, to work together into driving the solution. And just to, to give an example, I was telling you, what can we do as a regulator policymaker is putting in place policies and, and, re and, and regulations and targets, uh, providing uh, support, uh, money, uh, uh, but also bringing together the public sector. It was mentioned here in the picture because you mentioned one dollar put by the public sectors, you will have at least a two dollars investment uh, by by industry. Sometimes certain areas we have even more that is needed from the private industry. We need to bring them together into those investments, and uh, and for that also uh, uh, one of the things that we do at the European level, certainly in the area of uh, those uh, low carbon fuels that we work on, we've put together uh, forums where between the policymakers, the actual users, so the companies, the carriers, but also the producers, they are the ones who are able to come together and to tell us what is feasible, what is not feasible, what will accelerate or not the transition. Uh, and they are the ones who should help us collectively drive the specific roadmaps. Sam Skinner was telling us with the blueprint in the US, we have the big picture, but we need to work in the details for each mode of transport and, and the different areas in the specifics and details. That's what we do together, at least at the European level. Uh, and that's what we do also at international level at IMO and at ICAO, uh, respectively in aviation. Uh, but it's a joint effort. And it's good to see here in this room, actually, people com coming from all these different areas, uh, because that's what we what is needed. And I, I imagine at a policy level, you have the additional challenge of doing that in an environment where technology is very rapidly 
advancing. One subject that has been mentioned today is eVTOL uh, aircraft, which I think my, I, I mentioned because I think Miami will, is expected to be one of the very early places where those are deployed. And of course that technology, you know, initially will be you know, moving people around very short distances, but those technologies will improve and perhaps be suitable for other uses as time goes on. Yeah, hand up. Uh, I have a question. Actually, a, a few things uh, crossed my mind, like everybody, I guess. So Al Gore comes to my mind. I think he's the grandfather of uh, of these initiatives and uh, these great ideas. Uh, and then the other thing is a little bit uh, more recent, most likely Greta, um, teenage now, most likely in the 20s, uh, who has uh, moved the world and uh, a big politician and feared, I guess, a big corporation uh, to think about uh, what we are talking as well as here uh, here as well. So I think uh, from a practical point of view, uh, I, I would all like, Perhaps I would, would like to ask what are practical things which we can take home today, you know, to the dinner table, to the family, uh, uh, talk it over, and tomorrow we're going to the office and share uh, these inputs with colleagues, suppliers, clients, and, uh, and you know, what, what are practical steps which we could, you know, uh, suggest uh, at this time and, you know, support these all these great initiatives and, uh, and, and policies. And, and then perhaps uh, uh, also an input for, for Miami. Uh, what about like uh, every, every month, every three months, a, a car free morning uh, where everybody takes the bike, you know, and cruise Miami uh, by bicycle or rollerblades or whatsoever, and just, you know, Get rid of uh, and and use Palmetto for once as a as a as a as a biking line or something like that. So maybe uh, food for thoughts uh, to address uh, in the Miami councils or, or whoever. We are Swiss, so we come from a very free environment. Yes. Let's start with a car-free day once a year. Like <laughs> the best yes. I mean, in Miami, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm biking to work. <laughs> yeah, no. right? I bike to work today. Who, uh, who do we have to call to do that? <laughs> um, well, so Miami Beach does have cyclovias, um, and I think that one thing that we have here is the we have a lot of Colombians, and Colombia has been doing very cool stuff with this. Well, with the cars, though. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, no, but I mean, like <clears> without, they, they, they have, they have, have they've done that where they they take their freeway and close it for um yeah. for a weekend, and I don't or for like a morning or a day. And I've talked to people from there who are like, why can't we do that here? This is, there must be a spot where we so, could do it. So Paulo is shutting down. Yeah. That's a 55 million city or something like that. <laughs> so we, we could do it. We do it for the marathon. Yeah. I mean, you know, kind of. I definitely stayed home. <laughs> the marathon runs around my house. Just the morning. But, but I think it's possible. I like the question, you know, and, and I think we should, we have to start somewhere. I mean, uh, I understand policies, you know, and uh, air freight and the AC freight, that's all important. And uh, that, that, that's going to be 2030, 2040, till we're getting there. We're going to be 80 by mm -hmm. then, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. myself in 2015 when everything is, is green. So I'm happy to, you know, to, <laughs> <laughs> to get there. However, I think on short term, we have to push hard to get somewhere. Yeah, if, if if I may, I mean a few reflection on on on, on those questions. First of all, on the um, uh, you know car free day, etc. And uh, Christina knows uh, in Europe we have every year the Mobility Week. Uh, I think it's the third or fourth week of uh, of September, and on that Sunday we have tens, if not hundreds, of a city which do uh, a car free day. Uh, and we also actually we have uh, been able to to mobilize um, uh, different cities around the world. I think there were not that many in the US, unfortunately, but I, I would like to see that change. Mm -hmm. Also to tell us the specific uh, measures that they've take, put in place to, I won't say copy, but also take initiatives in that direction. And the idea is to raise awareness on mobility. And this also linked to what you asked the question, what should we do? What should, can we take back home? Uh, have that reflection but also realize one thing, uh, and I think it's also written, you know, in, in our strategy, we say uh, certainly for aviation and, and grow, when you look at the projections of the transport needs, the traffic, whether for goods or for passengers, in all modes of transport, road, uh, maritime, uh, aviation, 
they're all growing. And this is one of the, the I would say, the why we focus so much on transport. Transport sector has been the sectors, contrary to industrial production or others, which has continued to grow in terms of greenhouse gas emission in the last 10 years, where all the other sectors were decreasing, thanks to other means, huh? because we had the ETS, etc. transport has keep growing. But nowadays, what we say, the license to grow is to become sustainable. And just to give you an example, we, we discussed earlier in those, you mentioned Greta Thunberg, it's, it's really good. Greta Thunberg, some years ago, when I arrived in the US, actually almost four years ago, it was under another administration, by the way, but at that time, when I was discussing with uh, uh, colleagues and friends from the US aviation industry, the word sustainability was a taboo. There was a bashing of Greta Thunberg saying she's, a, she's an eccentric extremist, uh, doomsday person, etc. cetera. Uh, maybe there's something right about that. She was raising uh, the bar and the signals, but the aviation industry at that time, at least, they were considering that all this discussion, all the efforts, all the discussion proposals on reducing greenhouse gas emission altogether, and certainly for aviation, was a threat to aviation. This was almost four years ago. Nowadays, nowadays, the aviation industry, even globally, but also in the US, they are all, they have all signed up to the same objective and, and goal. They all realize that it's not by saying that, oh, you know, we are aviation globally, we are only between two and 3% of global emission, so you should leave us alone. It doesn't work like that any longer. What we say is that all sectors need to contribute. And the good news that I want to say is that there you have a sectors which says, well, yes, we have to do, and some of their leaders, just to mention one, Scott Kirby, the CEO of, uh, of United Airlines, you also see some leaders in, in the maritime sectors have come up and say, now, this is important. This is important for me, for my kids, for generations. You need leadership at all level to change the mentality. You need to explain why we do that. And you need leadership. And so that's something that you have to take with you. Uh, and I would say, think of, you know, it's a, it's a stepwise approach. Think of the, the small things that you can do and certainly when you, as a, as a freight forwarder, explain to your customers, you have options. You have different options uh, there. It's a start of, it, of the discussion. So there are things that you can do. I think that's great. I, I'm keeping uh, mindful of the time and I understand we have some questions from our online audience. So. I'll pass you then. Okay. Do one at a time. Um, so uh, the first question was, what about getting cars off the road? Um, uh, haven't heard anybody speak about the importance of adopting this. Uh, <laughs> hmm? No, sorry, I was making a joke, but yeah, mode shift. Yeah. Yeah. But, this is, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, a, a simple question with a difficult answer because getting cars off the roads means that you offer an alternative which is viable, uh, which is practical uh, for, for, for the people. They are ready to, to, to ditch, not to ditch, but maybe not to use systematically a, a car if they have an alternative which uh, works well, I would say. And that's where well, the alternatives comes into the picture. And that, that's sort of in line with what we were saying earlier. If some of these other programs lead to people, you know, buying less cars and yes. running other modes of transportation. I think the, the other embodied carbon in that is in the roads themselves. Yeah. Uh, we could save a lot of money if we didn't build as many roads and we'd save a lot of carbon. And the final question um, uh, is also something we touched on briefly, which is with air transportation being identified as one of the biggest uh, emitters of CO2, is Europe, in, is Europe incentivizing the development and launch of EV tall urban air mobility, which makes the use of electric power for air transportation. Uh, clearly, we have also a path like in the US to support the development. And actually, we, uh, in, in, in putting in place the regulatory framework for EV tall, we are even slightly ahead or, uh, and in 2024, for the, uh, Olymp uh, the, the, uh, the 
Olympic Games in Paris, you will have a number of demonstration of e-vital uh, usage. They will have at that time probably uh, some specific uh, regulatory license to operate, but certainly we are pushing hard uh, on that because, uh, well, e-vital uh, and the whole discussion on, uh, you know, decarbonizing part of the uh, uh, air transport uh, for freight and uh, electrical aircraft, basically, it's, it's a discussion by its own, but certainly it's complementary. That is why today you see that a lot of um, traditional airlines, United and American Airlines and others, have already invested in the developments of uh, some of those eVTOL uh, companies mm -hmm. because they see that the end-to-end -end proposition that you would provide to your customer uh, saying that we provide, we incentivize the usage of sustainable aviation fuel for the the biggest part, which is the most polluting, by the way, you know, the long hauls. And at the same time, you will have for the, the final last mile, if you want, a solutions, which is electrical, not less noise, electrical. Uh, and uh, so this is part of their solution. This is how they envisage this. But the business model of eVTOL is a, is a discussion on its own, by the way. Yeah. Um, I have a question here in the room. Hi, thank you for such a wonderful uh, panel. Uh, a question. There is, in South Beach, there is a lot of new buildings coming up, including a 600-room hotel. And I was always wondering, are ferries an option from here to South Beach? Because there is a water taxi, but it's not frequent enough. It's expensive, and nobody knows about it. So if we could have more water taxis that really, really work, that would be very Nice. I made one hour from South Beach here right now. You know, so. For the benefit of our online audience, because there's no microphone back by you, let me just re repeat the question, which is there's a lot of development on places like Miami Beach and what role could ferries play ferries. in, the, um, yes, and water in the solutions here? Uh, okay. <laughs> so I can, I can answer a little bit. Um, I mean, I think they could play a role, obviously. Um, we have the water and the space. I've heard people talk about it. Um, and I just this last week, someone was pitching to me this idea that we could do electric water taxis. And they said the same thing. They have to be frequent. They probably would be smaller. Um, and the question is, where do they go? Because we don't have that many spaces to drop off. And dropping off at the port doesn't make much sense because you get to the port and then you get in the car. Um, and so there are definitely things to work out there. And I don't know what we would do for subsidies, but I did just see um, that in New York, they're gonna be piloting some water, some electric water taxis, at least they're working towards them that are um, a hydroplane. And so they're gonna be a lot less bumpy and potentially faster. Um, and I think that that is, that's what I would love to get from partners, right? If you, if either, if you guys hear about some good uh, electric or, I mean, because I, preferably that's what it would be. We would get some kind of electric water taxi. It could work here. It would get a ton of visibility. Um, and we are definitely behind some of the other ports where they have more established ferry services. I know that um, Seattle is doing that and I'm sure there's a bunch of examples in Europe, but we just don't have the existing ferry service. So I don't see those companies coming here and piloting here. Any other questions in the room? I just have Any a comment. Week? Maybe we need a, a master plan for water transportation in Miami, which would combine different types of of transportation, but you need to plan first and then kind of decide which bits of it are going to be covered by what type of transportation. What's just the comment? <laughs> I, I do have a question um, for, for you all, um, for Emmanuel. I'm wondering, yeah. like, what, what could, have you been thinking about how we avoid kind of locking into infrastructure that we're not going to need in the future? Do you know what I mean? Like, um, beyond just the supply chain, like what the investments are kind of strategically to invest in, I don't even know exactly what it would be, but something to handle the shifts that you're talking about. Right, so it's, it's a long run. It's a marathon, right? So we know it's going to take a lot of investment. You mentioned one 
one trillion? Three trillion. Three trillion here. One from the city and two from the private in 10 years, right? Yeah, no, that's across the US, but we need, but, uh, I think we need like five times that to yeah. do the transition. I think McKinsey said uh, it's it's nine uh, nine trillion a year every year until uh, uh, 2050 yeah. to reach net zero worldwide. So it's huge, huge amount of money. And that's going to mean a lot of new technologies. So we don't know. Right now we, we are playing with what we have and and we, we need to adjust. So we, we are doing our model with what is existing. In the future, we'll have, we'll have another fuel for the airplanes maybe, and then we'll, that's going to change, right? Right, so, so for example, right, we're gonna, we wanna build this big port, right? And an inland port because we wanna be more efficient, right? And we're like, say, hey, look, come to our port, we're super efficient, but then you do some modeling and are like, no, go to Tampa <laughs> or go to Charleston. <laughs> I mean, do, do you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, like, how do we position ourselves and be ready <laughs> And, and, and adapt dynamically, right? Because we're, we're not, we can't build it overnight, but I want to make sure that when we invest in that, it works. We can continue to be competitive, maybe adjust our business models. I don't know. Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. This is a really interesting discussion. Uh, I am trying to be mindful of uh, everybody's time. Why don't we continue that discussion over a glass of wine? That's good. Sorry to put you in. No, no, no. I just think saying. that's the question. That Sorry. is the question. No, it, it is a very important uh, question, but um, but let's uh, let's sort of uh, continue in a in a over a glass of wine outside. Let me thank you all for uh, what I thought was a really interesting discussion. Um, thank you all for coming, and thanks to our um, audience online as well. Christina, do you have some housekeeping for me? Yes, yeah, some very uh, final words. So again, so I don't know how many you know of you are still online. I wanted to thank you for for participating. We start a little bit late, so you're finishing a little bit late. That is, you know, what what uh, hybrid programs are all about. So thank you to Alan, our moderator, and our panelists, David, Emmanuel, Galen, and Gazim, for what was a really interesting uh, discussion on today's burning topic, which once again underlined the importance of the transatlantic um, discussion, also from a business perspective. Um, so I have a message for our attendees, both those who are here in the room and those who are online. Keep an eye on our website uh, and email communications uh, for upcoming events and opportunities. Uh, and if you're a member of the EACC and wish to be connected to a participant of this program, you should reach out to me because that's what we do. We're a connector. Whether online or in person, we can connect you if you're a member, of course. Um, Post-event connections are part of our membership benefits, as I just said. Um, so goodbye to our online attendees. And for those of us who are here, as Alan suggested, let's go for a glass of wine. And thank you. Thank you.